Alan Kappa, South South News, at the CoFace Country Risk Trends Seminar 2011. This is an annual event which looks at worldwide trends affecting the economies and the political life of countries around the world. And I'm delighted to have with us one of the panelists at today's seminar. Uh, she is the senior economist for COFAS, COFACE as we've been pronouncing yeah, it in the United States, okay. Christina Alcazera. Yeah. Thank you Thank for being you. with afternoon. us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. We, we were dazzled by your presentation. Thank you. You covered the entire globe in terms of looking at uh, economic comparisons and trends and uh, it was absolutely fascinating and you really could have gone on for a lot longer and we could have a lot more time now but yeah. what I'd like to ask you is some of the things that came out from your presentation. Uh, Europe is going through a certain amount of economic turmoil now isn't yeah. it? Yes. Um, perhaps somewhat unexpectedly we know about the problems with with Portugal, with Greece, with Ireland. Is this a trend that's going to continue? Is, there, is this turning into a real north-south divide in Europe, do you think? Before talking about a north-south divide, uh, just, just let's say that, of course, the three countries have been bailed out by uh, the European Union, yeah. the IMF, and the ECB. Uh, people used to say, who is next? That could be Spain. But Spain has uh, taken first steps very, uh, very early in order to uh, fix its financial uh, system, banking system. And uh, Spain was, before the crisis, had, no, uh, had a public debt which was very, very low, right. uh, which was the case actually as well of Ireland. Mm -hmm. uh, so the problem of, um, of uh, Europe at the moment is more a problem of the private debt uh, which has been uh, taken uh, by uh, the uh, government of the different countries uh, and became a public debt. Yes. If you take the external debt of, uh, of uh, these countries, uh, external debt that is uh, also household, uh, banks, uh, companies and public debt due to non-residents. Just imagine that the external debt of Ireland is 1,120% of its GDP. Whereas when Russia and Argentina went uh, default, defaulted into 1998 for Russia and uh, yeah. 2001 in, um, in for Argentina, their external debt was 68%. So that makes the difference. Now, uh, for, uh, for Europe and the Eurozone, the, the very urgent thing was not to create a banking system uh, crisis. So that's the reason why the bailout with much pain, much pain, not Spain, pain, uh, was implemented uh, in order to, uh, to avoid that uh, European banking banks went, went in, into a crisis because they are very much loaded with uh, uh, external debt of these countries and they are all stuck together like a glue. Yes. So uh, that was the most urgent, and th urgent things to do. Then the other thing to do is to restore competitiveness of these countries. And to restore the competitiveness of these countries, is, it, it, it takes time. You cannot ask a country to uh, fix its public finance in two years' time. But you can ask a country to fix its uh, public finance in several years and, and to fix its competitiveness as well, at any, and it takes time. Uh, if you take Portugal, if you take Greece, they have real problems, structural economic problems. For, for, but Portugal, for example, before the crisis, had started being uh, diversifying its economy towards electronics and more added value. But the crisis arrived, and it was too early for, for, for Portugal. Yeah. Now, um, the further, then Europe has to uh, implement regulation in order to avoid another crisis like that with, a, with, a, with, a, with countries getting so loaded with debt. Uh, now, is there a question of North and South? Yes, there is a question of North and South because the North of, of Europe is very much industrialized, whereas the South is, uh, is more relying on tourism, on uh, low added value uh, manufacturing uh, companies. But uh, if you take Ireland, uh, a, a big subject is Ireland shouldn't have 
uh, so low um, uh, taxes on companies. That's a big argument between mm -hmm. Germany right. and other members of yes. the Eurozone. Uh, but if you just take this out of, of Ireland, what, what will Ireland have in order to, gr to, to, to grow? You can imagine uh, Europe as a, as a, big, uh, a big continent and as in, in, in probably in, in other continents, you have some countries with some privilege like that. Well, Ireland could have this kind of privilege, attracting multinational, American multinational, on the territory of Europe as a whole, and not just on the territory of Ireland. So you can take, if you take I, Europe as a whole, it can, it, it can be st stood. Stood? Yes. Yeah. Well, why do you believe Germany is so successful? Because if you look back, to after reunification, when they had this huge debt mm. and huge political and social problems to mm -hmm. deal with. Mm -hmm. And yet today, the strongest economy in Europe and one of the strongest economies in the world. Several reasons. The first reason is that uh, the products of Germany are, have got a very good reputation yes. all over the world. We would all like to have yes. Mercedes, yes. The second reason is that uh, companies have benefited from a, a very strong bank support for many years as well. And SMEs are huge SMEs, very, very solid with strong finan finance, uh, financial position. Uh, the other thing is that uh, probably Germany has uh, not hesitated to, um, not to, lo to, to increase salaries for many years. That's the reason why in Germany, uh, that's the first time German households spend money in 2010. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, w so we can think that Germany is back on its two feet, uh, relying on export and investment, but as well on household consumption. But we have to be cautious. Let's see if it's going on. Right. Uh, because salaries are going up, uh, so they, they spend more, more money. But that's, that makes the difference because the productivity is better in Germany than it is in France or in right. Italy. Right, right. Uh, can we... Coface's business really is risk management, making trade more successful, easing the path of export, import, helping people doing business internationally. If we change continents for a moment and uh, we look at two continents, if we look at Asia and Africa, for example, um, what do you see there in terms of trends the mm -hmm. subject of mm -hmm. today's mm -hmm. symposium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what do you do when you advise clients about receivables, the risk factor? Mm -hmm. Do you look at a country purely on its economy? Is that, is that the way the we, advice works? We, we must, when we advise, we, we do not, we, well, we advise uh, customers, of course, but what our job is to say to a customer, the client with whom you are going to, to, uh, to work is going to pay you. That's the first job. Yeah. So to do that, we need to have data inf information data and to know how uh, the recovery of a claim uh, uh, is possible or not in such and such country. If it so goes wrong, if the deal goes wrong. If the deal goes yeah. wrong. If there is a litigation, is there a protection of the, of, of the, the creditors? Uh, so we have uh, settled um, a country at rating, uh, which, uh, which assess the average default, possible default of companies in a given country in the framework of their short-term trade operation. Yeah. It is based, it, it is quite unique. It doesn't exist anywhere. It is, uh, it is really a short-term rating. When you want to have a trade, partner in a country, you just go and check on the website of COFAS North America, for example, what is the assessment of COFAS in the short term. And the rating is based on our analysis of political, economic and financial data. Yeah. It is based as well, and that makes, that's what makes it quite unique, on the evolution of the payment incident as registered in our database. Right. And the third thing which makes it quite unique as well, I'm sorry to repeat so often the, the word unique, yeah. uh, is that we ask our team all over the world to assess the, uh, the degree of availability and the transparency of financial data, which is the material we need to underwrite risk. And we ask them to assess as well 
how fair is the judicial system to creditor. Right. And so we build a, a, a rating by itself, which is a business climate rating, which can be checked on our website as well, which tells you if uh, financial data are available, what is the environment, if you have a litigation, Will you, be, uh, will you be able to, 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 to be treated f with fairness? So if you take China, for example, and India, two big countries in Asia, uh, China, uh, we have difficulty to find financial data. And most of all, it is very difficult to recover any claims over there. Whereas in they India- They are looked upon as- Sorry? They are looked upon as important investment areas now, aren't they? So that's an interesting thing. Yes, it is, is an interesting is thing. But it's for the short term, you know. It's yes, a, absolutely. But no one wants to get... small claims, not... Well, but the business climate is not a good one in, in, in China. It is B, which is, uh, belongs to the, the speculative uh, yes. gr uh, gradings. Um, whereas in India, uh, where you have a lot of corruption as well as in, in China, but in in, I would say that in India, the corruption is more visible. If you want to, to uh, recover a claim, uh, India has inherited from the British... Uh, the legal uh, system. The, le the legal system, yeah. which is more sophisticated and, yes. and is a, it has inherited from uh, of the common law. So the business climate can, can be quite uh, of interest for, for the people who wanted to, in, to invest in, in, in area uh, where, where they think that th there might be some risk. Right. Now, I think it's your view that some of the economies of the developing nations are overheating. That yes, they are. Yes. They are. Uh, the explanation is the following. With uh, the Lehman Brothers uh, bankruptcy, yeah. uh, there was a, a slump in, in, in trade, international trade, and a withdrawal of capital inflows outflows then yeah. because investors wanted to, to have dollars in order to fix their, their balance sheet probably. Uh, so they implemented uh, a very aggressive fiscal stimuli. stimuli and uh, when the crisis has uh, stopped, they should have stopped their uh, stimuli. Just four countries did that. Uh, Philippines, Thailand, Taiwan and Singapore. Otherwise, they went on uh, pouring liquidity into their markets, giving credit. If you take uh, Vietnam, mm. uh, within a few years, uh, the Vietnamese uh, private sector has leveraged up to 140%, 125%, sorry, of its, uh, that's for household, uh, of this uh, disposable income. Uh, so that's, that's really a lot. Yes. Uh, so that's thanks to the, or because of uh, all the liquidity which was there. So you have inflation uh, due to, to the overheating and you have a lot of capital inflows which have come back with the liquidity uh, on the market due to the QE2 uh, of the United right. States. And because to fight against the appreciation of, uh, of their local currency, the central bank of these countries just uh, uh, put more um, uh, sorry, have a, have a, uh, I don't find the word in English. They have to sell their currency in order to make yes. it uh, yes. less, uh, less appreciation. And the capital inflows uh, just still arrive. The, the other thing is that uh, the carry trade operations have uh, started again because of the tightening of the monetary policy in most of the country in order to fight against infla inflation. Yes. And uh, these in the, the carry trade being, being attracted by the, the difference, difference in yields. So uh, all the emerging country at the moment are just on the breakdown in order how to fight inflation. I raised the interest rate, but in raising the interest rate, I attract capital inflows, speculative capital inflows. So the, dif the, the situation is difficult in Vietnam, yes. in India, in Turkey, in uh, South Africa. That's, uh, that's uh, the, the main countries which uh, have, uh, where we could fear a hard landing. Not in India, because India is a, is a, is a big nation. And, uh, but w in, in Vietnam, for example, we are very concerned, yes, because they have a very low level of foreign reserves, uh, because they have devaluated the dong very often, six times since June uh, 2008, and because they, uh, the, the economy is uh, in reaction uh, getting more dollarized and uh, goldenized. Well, in spite of these problems, do you have confidence that the developing nations can still continue to develop 
and weather some of these uh, yes, hopefully short-term economic storms? Yes, if you take China, China is such a, s a financial superpower yeah. uh, with uh, such a high level of uh, foreign reserve. It has just passed $3 trillion in April. Uh, if you, if you, and he has a lot of assets abroad. Uh, the potential is there. If you take India, they have a, a, a very uh, dynamic population, with a skilled population, but they, they suffer from an infrastructure problem because of the, their, their financial situation is not that good, so they cannot invest a lot in infrastructure, which are right. absolutely necessary for India to develop. So yes, potential is there. In Brazil, it's there. Yes, uh, definitely one has to be in these countries. Christine Altazur, a senior economist for COFES, COFAS. COFAS. Thank you so much for being with us. And, thank you. Uh, thank you to you. We look forward to seeing thank you. you again. Yes, thank, thank you, you very much. Bye-bye. Alan Kappa, South South News.